The following podcast contains mature language and spoilers. Listener's discretion is advised. Dead air. We got dead air. You were in the middle of a thought and you just stopped. We're drifting. Welcome to the Marvel Superheroes Podcast. I'm Diablo Frank, and with me are... The Legal Machine. Joe Fixit. And today we're going to look at the early solo adventures of the Black Widow, beginning with her appearance in... Uh, which book did that... Uh, we've got Marvel... Marvel Tales starring Spider-Man. Mar- uh, Marvel Tales number 67. <laughs> okay, and what book is it reprinting? It should be on the first page. Oh, uh, originally presented in Spider-Man number 86? I can't tell the printing is a little jacked up. 86 seems early, but maybe it's 86. You're talking about six, seven years into the series. Yeah, I guess so. So why don't you... Uh, Synopsize that first story. Okay, so this first story is basically Spider-Man has just had a fight with the Kingpin, and he's taken a nasty shot to the head. So he's kind of a little uh, concussed throughout the issue. And Black Widow in her old like fishnet outfit is kind of observing him. And is like, damn, I gotta get me some of these Spider-Man skills. So she goes back to her apartment, decides her new costume, which is the all-black outfit with the, with the belt, and uh, decides that she's gonna go try and confront Spider-Man to figure out his moves, like how he gets his strength, how he clings to walls, how he web slings, so that she can add it to her repertoire. They unveiled the new outfit. The whole time they're kind of flashing over to Spider-Man. He thinks he might be losing his powers because he's just not as fast as he used to be. He's sweating. Uh, so he's probably got what they call CTE now, which is famous with football players who have multiple concussions. Which, have they done that? Have they given a superhero CTE yet? I don't believe so. How have they not done that? Some sort of brain injury? So the whole time he's having these like re- these repercussions from this concussion he's got, where he, he starts to wonder if he's losing his powers, headaches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Black Widow confronts him, and she's showing off her web-slinging ability where she can kind of shoot it at the top of her wrist. She's using her Black Widow agility, and she's basically kind of kicking Spider-Man's ass. She's like, wait, why am I kicking your ass so hard? Because you're supposed to be Spider-Man. I'm learning I'm learning nothing from this confrontation. Obviously, the reason is because he's been kind of incapacitated with this concussion. And then eventually, he sort of was like, what the hell's going on? Oh, anyway, so he kind of sort of just like snaps out of it. He's like, okay, I, I can't screw up this anymore. Flexes and breaks out of her web, shoots his web shooters to clog up her shooters, and then just sort of jets the hell out of there. And she's extremely frustrated that she's learned nothing of his powers. Well, she also like, bails real quickly because she realizes oh hell he's been toying with me this whole time I, well, the whole point of me again. confronting him was to figure out what he's doing that's different that gives him the, the abilities he has and then when she sees how much more powerful he really is she's like oh deuce despite dressing like Emma Peel which is nice and all and she's got the Widow Bites which I think this is the debut of her Widow Bites isn't it or did she have that in the Iron Man stories says, it's my new Widow my new uh, or was that in the other one we read no 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 that was in the other one we read she does Widow Bite him here though she realizes as powerful as he is as natural natural as his ability is that he's probably born with her his powers it's nothing that she can replicate so she just needs to stick with her own distinctive powers and, and fighting style and and make that work to her advantage great costume yeah much better look it is funny though that they managed to do the coverage of her history and all of a sudden she's had red hair the entire time because it was dark hair early on right they get into her personal history too wasn't she kissing up on some dude did, did they get into that in that story i thought they they covered her personal history going up against iron man and the red guardian i thought she was and then she kind of blows him off because yeah. she starts having flashbacks of hawkeye and um the gar- uh, red guardian, red guardian. Yeah, yeah her husband the only man she loved and or loved enough to marry marry there you yeah. go thank you but yeah because the whole thing is, is hawkeye is the guy who set her on the course of going from a soviet spy to a heroine and then it, through her actions her first husband who was a costume hero himself manages to get himself killed and so she's trying to work off the guilt she feels for the death of her husband and just trying to wipe the slate clean and start all over again with a new life new costume because she's unhappy with the person she's been in recent years the red guardian was the russian equivalent of Captain America? That's the impression I get. Yeah, wasn't okay. what he was in the He Avengers, had a shield, right? right? A red shield? I don't know if he had a shield. I thought but he had a shield. Yeah. That stuff all happened in Avengers comics, didn't it? Did you read any of that stuff? Nah. Uh, maybe. Who's the creative team on this one? I don't remember. Did you mention? I did not mention. This is author, Stan Lee, illustrators, John Romero Jr. and Jim Mooney. I thought this was a good looking story. Yeah, it was good. It was nice. The whole thing was just a backdoor pilot though, which is why it was just so random. She's gonna fight Spider Man in this one story where he happens to be compromised so that there is an even ish match. 
but is a backdoor pilot for her solo strip and amazing adventures, an anthology series that she shared with the Inhumans back in 1970. I do think that that's about right as yeah. far as the issue number. Amazing Adventures number one. Miss Fixit, you read that one? We've got a reprint from Giant Sized Avengers that we're working off of. I think that many, if not all, these stories are available on the Marvel Unlimited app. I have to go check though. Then came the Black Widow. Um, Stan Lee. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Written by Gary Frederick and John Basima was the artist. Who inked him? Did they say? John Verporten. Oh, Verporten. Okay. It, yeah, so it did right. not look like John Basima. It looked a little bit like John Basima, but not tons like. Well, no, the, the, some of the villains do look his style. Got like the cover page. It looks pretty tight. Um, this well, yeah, one. Yeah, it's, it's like it's a silhouette of a spider. spider and she's yeah. fighting. What is she within it? Or she's like different action montage around it? Is that what, uh, Kind of. In, yeah. It, actually, yeah, around it. So it's kind of this. Each part of the screen is cut up into the spider it, outlines it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so in this one, she kind of does a flashback of the story Mac just told us. She seems to be in the retire mode. She doesn't seem to be really doing anything. She sees her Spanish maid crying over something, begins to dig into what's going on with her, finds out that her son is in trouble with some gentleman, breaks down, leaves, and for some reason, Black Widow decides that she's going to go out and handle this herself, puts on her new costume, does some quick running around, talks about her new anti-gravity shoes, and then her widow's web across the room. She begins to go and investigate and has Ivan bring the car around to drive her into the apparently shadiest part of town. All the hoodlums check out the car. Ivan is somewhat concerned about dropping her off in this neighborhood where there seems to be debris and burned out buildings. She whips off her coat and then begins to climb up the wall. She's going to use her own way and basically begins to observe what's going on inside the building through the window. She's peeking through the window. There's these two mobsters in there telling the uh, maid that her son had borrowed some money. The interest was due and that they were going to hurt him. They're dragging him off. She jumps in. One point two, they threatened to do something to her. And he's like, look, don't do not do anything to her. Yeah, don't do it to my me. mom. Yeah. Which they responded to positively. She commences to beat the hell out of him. The police show up. She disappears. Someone gets a photo of her. And that's it. Yeah, and that, Wasn't there another part to this? I thought there was a... F- oh, no, no. He comes back. Up. Never mind. It was I'm sorry. just weird at the end of that episode because she's having some like weird moral dilemma with whether or not she's going to continue to be Black Widow. It's very strange. Because she doesn't have her face covered. You know what yeah. I mean? It's very strange. I thought that one was a very weird issue. That and the fact that this kid straight up owed debt to these mobsters. And so she offers the mom, well, here, here's my checkbook. If it's money, we'll just pay these guys to go away. And she's like, no, he needs to learn how to handle these things on his own. And then, but it's like, these dudes are going to murder you. Yeah, like, he's going to get handled. So I, I don't understand how Black Widow showing up and whipping up a couple of the dudes and getting them arrested is going to somehow keep this kid from getting murked further down the line either. Like, oh, I'll go punch one of them. That'll make them not want to settle their debt with this kid. I, I didn't understand what the whole point of that issue she was. And like I said, at the end, because they get a picture of her because she's not wearing a mask, she's all like, oh, well, this is going to reveal my secret identity. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this at all or whatever. And I'm like, what the, what the hell is the point of this issue? Very strange. What about you, Fix? What did you think of the story? Um, I guess, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's an early Marvel story. So, I mean, um, <laughs> Well, no, it's that, weird. That's a very objective <laughs> statement. It's definitely an early Marvel it's story. It's definitely yes. printed on paper with the colors <laughs> and shapes. Mac made a good point. Like, she's willing to help this lady out, but the lady's like, no, no, we'll handle it ourselves. They're going to murder your kid. Well, like, she may not have known that they were going to go that far. That true. Quickly. But then you got an Avenger beating up two street thugs. It just seems a little overkill. Her driver, like, they're trying to introduce some sort of supporting cast, right? Yeah. But <laughs> again, at the end of the episode, she's like, shit, I shouldn't be doing this superhero shit anyway. The end. It's, uh, it was a very strange issue. I guess this was kind of a filler story, maybe? No, this is the first installment of her ongoing serial. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. This They're launching that... the book based on the strength of this Black Widow story. This was the setup for that first story. Wow. The Spider-Man story wasn't very good. It basically was just like, look at oh, my new costume and powers, and this is the reason why I have my new so, costume and powers. So wait, wait. And now I, now that I've beaten Spider-Man while he's compromised, join me in Amazing Adventures. You so know? I'm, I'm going to take on a super-powered being, get new weapons, and go beat up regular old human beings with these same weapons because some kids got a gambling debt well and not just that too she'd proven against spider-man that oh the shit that i got really isn't that good really isn't that so good. I, let me go beat up random thugs in queens yeah the only one instance where i've got the original copy instead of a reprint i've got amazing adventures number two here it is from september 1970 the lead story is the inhumans by writer artist jack kirby which is interesting to see because it didn't occur to me that kirby was still around at this point and had done stuff where he was clearly 
credited as the writer. So I'd be somewhat interested in reading this just to see if it's as good or as bad, depending on which direction it goes, as Kirby's period material was. If there was maybe some proto uh, new uh, god stuff in there or something. Also, I don't know if they flipped back and forth, but technically Black Widow is the backup strip. She's second build on the cover, and she's got the shorter of the two stories. This one's called The Young Warriors. It's written and plotted again by Gary Friedrich, penciled by John Basima, inked by John Verputin. It's basically the same sort of image as the splash image from the first issue, where you've got a, a central image of Black Widow and then a montage of action sequences around her. And my problem is that this story is a total of 10 pages, and so one of those pages is devoted to a meaningless splash page. I think that maybe both these stories, you want to start strong on a first issue, but it, it seems like losing a page of story, given how bleh the story has been so far, wouldn't be the best way to go. But by the same token, I'm wondering if maybe the reason why they're doing this is because they don't know what the fuck to do with this character, and it's just a way of filling space because they're getting paid for 10 pages regardless of what's on the pages. So, in this issue, oh, this is where it happens. So, yes, she's kissing the dude. The dude doesn't kiss as good as superhero people, so she <laughs> has him leave. They, they make a point of saying that she's more known as Madame Natasha, this jet-setting identity she's created around herself. She's basically a Bruce Wayne for the 1960s. She's running around in her Emma Peel outfit. No, everybody from Jackie O on down would want to be able to fill out a suit like this. Blah, blah, blah. So then she goes and visits uh, her new Latino friend. Uh, what the, what's a fucking kid's name again? I feel like you're trying to bait me into just naming a bunch of Hispanic names. <laughs> well, it, it's Carlos. So that that's pretty close. You'd, you'd probably nailed it within the first three to five of them. Very good possibility, yeah. Uh, and it's Maria and Carlos besides. So God, let's let's really do this. And so I guess apparently they're now that they, because they could clearly see that Madame Natasha is running around in leather and beating people up. Oh, you're the Black Widow too. So now they're hanging out her apartment. Black Widow decides to show off how good she is at being Black Widow. So you have an entire page of her just like jumping around a gym, showing off her different toys and her athletic abilities. And it's nice looking. It's a good, I mean, she's sexy in the outfit. It's good drawings. But wow, we're halfway through the story already and fuck all has happened. So then what it turns out is that Carlos is in a gang and mm. called the Young Warriors. Mm. And what they're going to do is they want to illegally. So is that why the, the new Warriors were the team that came after them? Could be, could be. Uh, also led by a minority, but uh, a little slightly more effective group. Uh, Night the, Thrasher. That's the one, yes. The the, the huh? skateboarding vigilante. Huh? You forgot about him. With truncheons. Is he the skateboard like attached to his back? Yeah, there's a lot wrong right from go. And, and this guy came out right around the time of Rodney King, and he's dressed like a fascist with truncheons. Like, that's a, that, there's a reason why they kind of got rid of that character and forgot that he ever existed. So anyway, the young warriors are, have decided they're going to illegally take over a building. They're doing this because it's owned by Anthony Scarola, who is some sort of political figure who has been representing this barrio. And so he figures, you know, nobody will ever do anything against us. Us. We're the only reason why any of you people get to eat. And the young warrior is like, bullshit, you suck, down with the man, get the fuck out. And so they, they basically run this guy out. And then they set up, it's like a soup kitchen for children. They set this up like the same day. Or Carlos does this? Carlos does this. Oh, he's such a sweetheart. So Classic Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> Free breakfast for all the children. For the first time, our people are eating food instead of campaign promises from the mouths of social criminals. Definitely a Bernie bro. Yeah, oh, definitely. During the very first breakfast, after they've taken over this building run by mafia guys, mafia guys show up, dressed like it's still the 1930s, complete with a fucking Tommy gun. Yes. And they're like, we're going to just shoot you all. We could take legal measures against you because you're here illegally. But the boss thinks that maybe we should shoot people in front of children or just shoot children with Tommy guns in 1970. Black Widow just happens to be there being shown around by Carlos. So she proceeds to beat the fuck out of these guys. And uh, then the cops randomly show up. That was quick. And and they serve notice to Carlos. Hey, get the fuck out of here. You're illegal. You're lucky <laughs> that we're not taking you to fucking jail. Um, They're trying to make the barrio great again. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos is like, no, no, we, we've got everything set up. This is where people know to come. You illegally occupy 
occupy this fucking building, you know? You squatters out. So then this reporter dude shows up, this Steve Trevor looking motherfucker. Strange words coming from a superheroine who's aligned herself with the militancy of the young warriors. I'm Paul Hamilton. I'm a columnist for the New York press, among other things. Perhaps you don't know it, but some of the papers have already made a red eyed radical out of you, including, unfortunately, my own newspaper headline, Black Widow Aligns with Militants. And so they're introducing this guy on the last page where he's like, well, maybe I can work with you to help your image and next issue a city against her and it's like what the fuck are we doing this story doesn't make a lot of sense no, 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 what is the and end game here who, who, who wants to fucking read this story I, they're trying to like be politically aware but they're not really getting that across and why is black widow involved in inner city crime it's just like the fucking shit with black panther where he comes over as the king of the wakandas he sees the slums of new york city and decides oh i'm going to become a school teacher <laughs> you're the fucking king of the wakandas what the fuck is this shit i'm a leftist you know, I don't I don't make a secret of that. But this is just some dumbass, short-sighted, thoughtless, knee-jerk liberal bullshit. It's got nothing to do with the fucking characters. They want this feel-good bullshit where it's like, yeah, I'm on the side of the insurgents. To do what? To do illegal shit and to have really shitty plans and to antagonize people that you know are prone to fucking violence because you got a fucking superhero that's going to high kick them? What the fuck is this shit? These are bad fucking stories. Yeah, this is three in a row, just fucking garbage. I just don't think they know what the fuck to do. I think the Spider-Man story was okay because they at least knew who the character was and they have her do some superhero type shit by finding Spider-Man. But then you get into the ongoing series and it's like they're just completely fucking spinning their yeah. wheels with this shit. This was like written on like a cocktail napkin and somebody just said turn this into a 10 page story yeah it's, it's like a lot of what? fucking filler and no rhythm to it and and i say cocktail just... napkin because they were obviously drinking heavily when they began <laughs> doing <laughs> actually i wish they'd been drinking heavily i don't For think that kid, they, they drunk enough they, they stole a building and they were trying to serve kids soup in a soup kitchen and then <laughs> that's like what's what's going on dude like <laughs> who, who came up with this it seems almost like it's too hard to come up with mm -hmm. like i feel like if it's one of those things where you can have like google randomly generate shit this is like some random random Mad Lib shit that Google would have created. Yeah, it's, it's like listening to uneducated supporters of a political candidate where they're like, he's really great because... Yeah, yes, this is, like if, this is like if you took internet comments and constructed them into a story. From people who are ill-informed, who don't know how things actually yeah. work, who can't tell you the ABC. It's just like, well, because he says he's going to do this, because she said hey, we're going to do that. It's well, like, somebody should come and shoot up your soup kitchen with a Tommy gun. I bet his name's Carlos and Maria. <laughs> <laughs> And he's the guy, and he owes money. And see, that's the thing, too. They never get into, why does Carlos owe money to mobsters? Yeah. Did they say something about like gambling debts and shit? I think, I thought they were, no, I, I mean, maybe I, I assumed they were gambling debts. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be, you know, a dozen churro habit a day. Oh, no, dude. Thing. It was cockfighting. Or he bought, he took out money for a taco truck and didn't pay him back. <laughs> I'm surprised. Like, they, hey, hey, it's all so it what The 70s weren't ready for taco trucks. It's just so obviously written by just like an old white guy. No, I think it's, I, I think it's a young, ignorant white guy. I, that's what I mean. A young, ignorant white guy. Who's an old white guy now. Yeah, that's true. Because yeah. of time. Where does it? What is it called? Um... Felt almost like method writing, like they were just writing shit down, and it's gonna. Yeah, I, 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 I think out. that it was some guy, probably with a deadline, feverishly writing with a vague sense of what the fuck they were doing after reading something in the paper and, and getting really hot over it. So yeah, yeah. Well, what's riling the kids up nowadays? Yeah, except soup kitchens. Soup kitchens are the thing. Yeah, soup kitchen. People want soup kitchens, and other people want them to not have soup kitchens. Uh, okay, that's the, the story. The, in turn, go the, write the it. The people in the slums don't have what they need. What do people in the slums need to feed their children? Soup kitchen for children. What? <laughs> I, I love Maybe. the line. What was the line where uh, now they can eat food instead of the lies of government? <laughs> <laughs> It, it sounds kind of great. It's, yeah, it's dumb as shit. Yeah. Who, what, a child can't get nourishment from lies. What a ridiculous <laughs> comment. These children would have been dead years ago. <laughs> They're obviously eating something, whether it be garbage or drugs. <laughs> They're getting some sort of nourishment. Just silly. Yeah. And this is why the series didn't make it. Let me look real quick. I don't know how long this shit lasted. I'm curious now. Does this mean we can finally like do that Marvel fanfare stuff? Have we done enough Black Widow now that we can actually like read or look at pretty black widow stuff i, I think so yeah i think we yay! i think we can jump from here to that yay 
okay. Who wrote those? Well, it was pretty. That John Buscema's nothing to or Buscema. Somebody told me the pronunciation. I think it actually is supposed to be like Buscema. Okay. Uh, just like Kubert is Kubert with a hard Kubert. It's Art T Bear because he's Canadian, so he's got that French fied spelling or whatever. Yeah. But the Americans say Kubert apparently. So, uh, but I've been saying Kubert for fucking twenty years now. I don't know if I can adjust. So is it Jan Derskema? Shit, she followed us. Ask her. Okay, I will. But the but that's just another typed medium. Okay, so Amazing Adventures managed to make it to six issues. Is that right? What? Okay, good. Yeah, six issues. Yeah. Well, no, because because the next volume was thirty nine issues. So they got six issues out of this volume. Wait, no, no, they got thirty nine issues. But she continued to be in it for thirty nine issues. No, I, I'm pretty confident that didn't happen. She made it to issue eight, and then they had full length in Humans Adventures, and then they brought in the Beast, which ties this fucking shit into the Hellcat. Oh, I didn't yeah. even fucking know it. Yeah, yeah. So hey, cool. The, that's it the all beast, kind of uh, mad dog shit, right? Yeah, was, was it was it still Amazing Adventures at that point, or I was it no bizarre? Earth, anyway, man. Fuck it, who cares? So anyway. One of the reasons why I want to read this, besides the fact that it shows the transition of Black Widow from the Iron Man villain to the version that we're more familiar with, and it shows the trajectory of the character. Because from this point, after Amazing Adventures wraps up, she goes to San Francisco and is the partner for Daredevil. And so this kind of sets her level where she's a street-level vigilante instead of a international super spy. And then she's the sidekick of Daredevil for quite a few years. So this is, this is where they take her. This is where they take this character. I guess I can kind of see the seeds of that. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. And this carries on until the 80s, at least. That's actually one of the things when we see the Marvel fanfare stuff, she's back into international affairs and espionage type shit and super powered beings. But for most of the 70s, it's just her hanging out with fucking Daredevil fighting street level people and fucking stilt man and shit, whatever the fuck. I don't know. What, who the, nobody fuck. Nobody cares what the fuck Daredevil was doing in the 1970s. And she was the token chick hanging out with Daredevil. Daredevil was C-list. So what's that mean for her? She's yeah. she's the sidekick to a C- C-lister. And the romantic interest of a C-lister. So here's one of the things I'm going with. Besides the fact that this helps us to transition to greeting better Black Widow stories, because I like to do a semi-chronological kind of thing with these character spotlights. But here's what I'm thinking. Obviously, Ike Perlmutter has issues with women. And, you know, recently it was revealed that Shane Black, when he was writing Iron Man 3, was going to have a female antagonist, probably somebody along the lines of the Rebecca Hall character, a character that I was interested in, I thought was really wasted in the movie. I mean, she seemed almost have no point whatsoever for being in the movie. She's the one who shows up to tell Tony that people are coming after him after he told people to come after him. But I like the idea of a female antagonist, and we haven't seen that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Really. Has there been any fe- evil women in the Marvel Cinematic uh, Universe? We'll get or? one probably in the next Thor, I'm guessing. But Maybe, but but right now, where no, are no, we no, at? No, no, no. I don't think so. Nothing, right? Uh, maybe Nebula? No, who in the movies that have actually come out so far? Yeah, Nebula. Yeah, Nebula in the Guardians oh, of the Galaxy Guardians. movie that came out. Oh, Thank you, sir, sorry. for paying attention during yeah. the podcast. Yeah, I had to think about it, but yeah, he's right, Nebula. But not a primary. She was a lackey. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But good catch. So yeah, and then I would say, too, that Whitney Frost in uh, Agent Carter was great, too, but nobody watched that shit, so it doesn't really matter. So we haven't had any really strong and certainly not a primary female antagonist. We would have if things had progressed the way they were intended to do with Iron Man 3. The understanding is that Ike Perlmutter directly or via the toy company's well-known biases with the Ray controversy uh, right to the Star Wars, you know, here's one of the two primary characters in a brand new Star Wars movie and we're not going to make action figures and shit of uh-huh. her. Stupid. But they basically said, you know, we can't sell a women, woman protagonist as an action figure, so you're going to have to change your script for a fucking movie. That got a lot of people pissed off when that got revealed. Here's the problem. I, the reason I don't get that is, did you see any of the other dudes' toys anywhere? Like, I don't... I don't remember Iron Man 3 Did toys, they even make Iron Man 3 toys? I, yeah, they did. They, there is an, there, my understanding is that there is an Aldrich Killian action figure out there. There is an... Is there really? Yeah. I don't okay. know if there's a Pepper Potts, but there's a there's apparently an Aldrich All Killian. Right. I, and I you know what? I actually think for some reason I can picture a Pepper Potts extremist pick uh, uh, a toy. Yeah, okay, but, but I, I don't. That I may, I may just be making that up. I just don't know how I can remember that name. I, I of all the things I've remembered and forgotten over the legit. years, I can't remember. I don't. I I just can't believe I remember that fucking dude's name. Wow. Anyhow. Because he was entirely forgettable. In that not just that. That's not an easy name either. Aldrich yeah. Killian? Aldrich no Killian. fucking humans have that name. That's like the name of two different surnames put on like a hospital or a production plant or something. Mm-hmm. This is Aldrich. The law offices of Aldrich Killian. Boy, I wouldn't want to get sued out of those fuckers. No. So uh, we didn't get the female antagonist. And then, of course, people have been saying, well, when is Black Widow getting a movie? For years and years. Where, where's our movie? All the other guys have movies. The only one who doesn't have a movie besides her is Hawkeye. When are we getting that? And uh, now... 
they're actually seriously talking about finally getting around to a Black Widow movie. There was apparently a really excellent script written a number of years ago by someone who pretty much, I think, I don't, I don't know if they did it on spec or it was just a passion project for them. And it was very well received, but they had no intention of making this Black Widow movie. You know, whenever they'd ask Kevin Feige, he would just kind of him and haul and not give a straight answer. Well, now that I promoter is not reigning over Marvel Studios, all of a sudden they're seriously going to look at doing this Black Widow movie. Well, not just a movie, I believe franchise was the word they used. Well, I mean, well, if they're going to do one I think movie. everything they intend to be a franchise. Yeah. yeah. Ant Man's going to be a franchise. So, I mean, but sometimes yeah. I wonder, was that always planned, though? I don't think that they, they could necessarily assume there was going to be a home run. I mean, that, there's a reason what, why Ant-Man? it took, yeah, yeah, it took a while to get that out, yeah, I'm sure in so. part, because who knew if that was going to be one that would make it? I mean, that was one of the ones. No, I, I know, think, but, I, but, but I'm saying now it's made it. Yeah. So now they're like, yeah, boom, we're going to Everything that comes out now is a franchise. If we can make Ant Man a franchise, everything's going to be a franchise. And even if it's not a franchise, so here's the thing. I'm not really sure if any of these movies are really like, do uh, you really think a series of Black Widow movies is going to be Black Widow? Or do you think they're going to have Chris Evans and all to, well, to they, 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 there was all a, there was a thing or Hawkeye and all of them? Yeah. They're all going to be pseudo mini Avengers movies, I'm afraid. Well, and already or, uh, I mean, Anthony Mackie has been like, hey, I want to be the Falcon in the Black Widow movie. Right, of course. So already, you know, getting on that. Hey, racket. I want to be the Falcon. <laughs> hey, <laughs> this is the Falcon and I'm in your movie. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you want to talk to Red Wing some more? <laughs> yeah. R- remember Red Wing? <laughs> It's me, the Falcon. I, I, I uh, you know, I, I haven't seen any big surge in Falcon movie talk, so there's just something well, now, to that. Well, now there's a um, neck and neck competition between Hawkeye and Falcon, and right, who's the least Who, favorite of yeah, th- They're going to be all in her movie too. Mm. But, but okay, so here's the thing though: when Black Widow was introduced in Iron Man, that character, after you'd seen her in that one movie, did anybody want to see her fucking movie? I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not talking about like feminists and people who want representation. Yeah, like, like a female I'm talking about just born, born movie or what? Well, I'm talking about you when you watch Iron Man 2, when you walk out of You're that like, movie. Damn, they better spin her off into a movie. No, I thought it was really cool. I mean, she came out and kicked some ass, but I didn't think she warrant a movie. After Avengers, what did you think? Nope. No. And I, I loved her in Avengers. I, I, I thought that some of the best scenes in that movie were Black Widow scenes. I, after hating on Scarlett Johansson, you know, I, I just, I really did not like her as Black Widow the first time out. And I was still very resentful. I, I because, really like her in Iron Man 2. So I don't understand why you. No, I, it, well, she, she didn't look right to me. I, I, I didn't think. I just that, looked hotter in Iron Man 2 than she looked mm-hmm. in any of these other movies. Yeah, and I, I completely disagree with that. And I just was so resentful because it should have been Mila. It's Mila Jovovich's role. She's a fucking redhead. She's a fucking Russian. She does action movies. She dresses like that. All the Resident Evil movies is the kind of shit that Black Widow would be able to do yeah. in her movies. I, I know she's not that big of a star. I, I she's have a great tied, love for Mila Jovovich. But she's Jovovich. already kind of tied to the Resident Evil movies, so. There is that. And well, and also, I'm sure age is a factor because oh, yeah. by the time they I started doing these, up, yeah. she's... Uh, uh, if she's not, she's 40 at she this point. She still looks ridiculous. She's fucking gorgeous. She looks she ridiculous. Looks so good. Scar I just Joe, think Charlotte Johansson's a hipper, newer She's a actor, hipper right? person. She's also, she was a bigger name. In fact, I think the argument could be made that she seemed like she might have been too big of a name at that point in time. Uh-huh. So then you go into, the, and I, like I said, I did, I did not care for her performance at all. I did not like her in Iron Man 2 at the time I saw it. And then I saw Avengers and I thought the character was so well handled. I thought that Scarlett Johansson had just made a quantum leap in how she interpreted that character. Character, and the writing on the character was so much better in Avengers than in Iron Man 2 that it retroactively made me forgive whatever issues I had with the character when I would watch Iron Man 2 again. I just loved Black Widow in Avengers, but I still not, didn't see a movie there. You know, you could do a, maybe a little TV series or something like that, but not an actual movie of nothing but Black Widow. And now? Well, I'm, well, I'm still going. Then we see the Winter Soldier. She's badass in Winter Soldier, too. She's so yeah. fucking badass in Winter yeah. Soldier. After the Winter Soldier, did you see a movie for her? Um, I, I was a little more on board with it after Winter Soldier. Maybe a flashback movie? See, well, but then then you got Age of Ultron. Well, I, but, that, but I don't want to jump into that just yet. Well, that's the next movie. I know that's the next movie, but I'm not done talking about Winter Soldier. Okay, okay, okay. okay. I was on board with Winter Soldier because for starters, it showed that Avengers wasn't a fluke, that Scar Joe had made that progress in interpreting the character, that she was just as interesting in Winter Soldier as she had been in Avengers. Maybe not quite as interesting, but she had so much more screen time and she was so much more vital to the overall story in Winter Soldier versus where she had been in the Avengers. There was this obvious tension between her and Captain America. You can't just have her keep showing up as a sidekick to Cap and that I really felt like that movie was a a great showcase to show what was possible with the character of Black Widow. 
but I didn't feel like her partnership with Cap was sustainable. Not only did she demonstrate that there was a lot of story to tell with this character and that she could carry a movie, because that's the first time she really had to do that. She's got a supporting role in the Iron Man movie. Yeah, she she kicks a lot of ass, but I don't feel like she was integral to that movie. She wasn't integral to the Avengers. She's smart. She gets information out of Loki. I don't feel like the Avengers wouldn't have done what they did without her. But by the time you get to the Winter Soldier, the Winter Soldier doesn't work without Black Widow. Mm -hmm. She's so important to driving that story, contrasting her against Steve, his determination and his morality versus her cunning and her recognition of the true forces at work in the world and her willingness to compromise and his ability to sway her to not compromise when there is a point where you have to make a stand and not just to adapt and not just to hide in the shadows and let tragedies unfold in front of you. I thought that movie was hugely important to the development of the Black Widow character and that's when I saw, okay, this actress in this role is ready for her own movie and then Age of Ultron. Yeah, I think she took a serious step back in Age of Ultron. I kind of liked some of the flashback stuff. I don't think they needed to sterilize her. That was kind of a little, probably went a little too far. I saw the reason behind it though because they didn't want her to get pregnant to care for something like the mission was the only thing she should care about. So Right, right, right. And it gave her a nice little dark twist. But to me, you're revealing so much that should have been a reveal in her own movie. But see, I don't. But again, I don't think they were planning her own movie at the uh, time. I know so they were trying to kind of cram. I'm it just in saying here. that's one of the reasons why you're like, okay, well, I don't need to hear any more of that yeah, backstory. It was sort of like the complaint that you have about books like Justice League with Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. You can't do anything interesting and really develop those characters. I think that Joss Whedon looked at the Avengers as okay, well, Black Widow's mine, so I can do stuff with her that I can't do with Cap, Iron Man, yeah. or Hulk. Mm, true, but it was, none of it was very good for me. As as a, but that's because the movie wasn't good. That's yeah, okay. Uh, I obviously have a strong emotional attachment to Julie Delpy from the Before Sunrise, Sunset, Before Midnight, and even the Two Days movies. I, I love the fact that she's the handler in this. I love that the fact that there is this female handler recalls, you know, Point of No Return, La Femme Nikita, that kind of stuff. I don't need a Black Widow origin movie. I don't want to see DJ CGI ScarJo. I like that her background is mysterious. I like that they make subtle references to shit that I don't want them to ever fucking pay off because the whole point is to add texture to the character and not you don't have to tell every goddamn story. I don't need to know that Logan is really James Howlett. You know, that kind of bullshit. So I I, I think they gave us just enough story of uh, just enough for a backstory to be intriguing and to show what kind of things she was subjected to and why she is the way that she is. But I don't want to deal with that at all. I want to see her in new adventures. But then Age of Ultron happens and she's one of the worst things about that movie. Well, and they also in the, some of the movies, they, they, they talk about the Loki talks about the red in her ledger. Right. I mean, like, mm. you know, she's done some fucked up. They've shit. hinted there's some the fucked hospital up fire. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. it's like, do you can stop right there? Yeah, you can stop right there. We don't the care hospital about. fire. OK, I right. know what the fuck happened there. That was not cool. There's two main issues. Main issue number one is that she was pregnant and they were having to work around her pregnancy, which is like the number one thing that everybody quotes for income inequality because everybody assumes at some point you're going to get pregnant and you're going to fuck up their work schedules and you're going to force them to pay out money they don't want to pay that takes money off their bottom line she's a terrible part of a movie that she had previously been great in because they're working around the pregnancy mm-hmm. it almost it's almost like it's funny to me that they have that serialization story in age of ultron because it's almost like metatextually referring to <laughs> how her pregnancy was fucking up this movie and fucking up joss whedon's plan Ooh, that's a weird way to look that's, at it yeah. <laughs> Ugh, that makes me uncomfortable. Right. Another issue, though, is that with Avengers, it's Joss trying to find those iconic moments and tell you stories about the characters as you know them and as you want to see them. And one of the failings of Age of Ultron is he decided to do a Joss Whedon movie and he wanted to do Joss Whedon shit. And he's forcing the characters to act in service to the types of stories he wants to tell rather than telling their stories. And that's how he ended up with bullshit like shipping fucking Bruce Banner and Natasha Romanoff. It doesn't fucking work I, I still and no, I mean, look, and, uh, nobody liked that it, it, nobody that, that's one of the big sticking points for most people with that movie it's like those two of well, all the well, people I didn't get I get that maybe she's the one that can calm him down and be his handler right that's fine mm-hmm. but to, I like that I didn't try see and, a, right right to, the lullaby and stuff yeah to try and develop some sort of romantic thing when did you think you were ever going to have time to actually revisit this mm-hmm. in a Hulk movie that they're never going to make in a Black Widow movie they're never going to make what was the point of any of that other than just wasted air like, you know what no, I mean it, uh, part of the point of it is for Natasha 
Natasha to betray Bruce and for Bruce to get sent the fuck off. They deal with it for one movie because they know they're never going to deal with it again. And again, I do think that is a situation where it's like, okay, well, we instead of having her kicking a bunch of ass and stuff, we can have all these talky soap opera scenes talky, talky. between them where she's wearing a loose fitting robe. So we're not having to worry about the bump showing. It felt like very much shuffling shit around just to make her appearance work at all. I suppose. Either way, it's a step back. Yeah, but at the same time, I really don't blame her. I blame the circumstances and the demands of their schedules and shit where they could have, should have just shot all of her stuff later or something. Yeah, or just not have Black Widow in it. She's off on a mission and just leave it at that. You have Maria Hill doing the lullaby. Yeah, you would take out all the Black Widow shit and give us more time with Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. So or those are better developed characters. Falcon do the lullaby. <sighs> with that shit <laughs> from there we go to civil war after civil war what do you think about this character she's badass dude she yeah. kicked more ass than almost anybody in that she, whole movie she, in terms of the physical combat demonstrated the choreography i think that she was absolutely the best performer but the character was best realized which is why i don't buy a lot fight. of what you just said it's because all that stunt work is done by stunt people they could have had her out of her freaking robes yeah come on man you would think but we look at age of Ultron, what? and obviously they were doing all kinds of weird stuff dicey yeah. shit that didn't fucking pan out out. It looked fucking fake. There's been some talk about that, like doing something with civil with her in Civil War. For some reason, especially the second time, I uh, I didn't have a problem with it the first time. But for some reason, the second time when I was complaining about the time frame in Civil War, somewhere in my brain, I thought that Natasha was with them. Like she had ended up on the raft. And of no. course, that makes no sense. When I thought about it for a little bit, it's like, she wasn't on the raft. What the fuck? What was I thinking about that? So if she was not on the raft, that also means that she's probably not in Wakanda. So she's not with those Avengers. She's seen as a traitor to Tony Stark's Avengers. There's no reason to assume that Black Widow even knows where the fuck Steve's Avengers are. So she's the one that's out on her own now. Mm -hmm. That's a story we need to fucking have told. I guess told. that's true. She's the one person whose storyline didn't get tied up. Yeah. Right. She's still out there somewhere. She knows that the government's coming after her. She knows that she doesn't have a home with well, Tony. She's definitely not going to be in Wakanda because she tasered Black Panther and mm -hmm. that's the end of that. Right? But even with him coming around, she doesn't know that they're there. Nobody can fucking right. know that they're there. So if nobody knows that they're there, Natasha can't know. So she's out there on her own. And it was, it's interesting to me because me and Fixit watch Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And they just made this big deal about spinning off two of the characters, uh, Hunter and Mockingbird. Mockingbird. Uh, Mockingbird, of course, being the more important of the two. This whole series was supposed to be about those two characters having done something in a very public fashion that makes it impossible for them to be S.H.I.E.L.D. agents anymore because their mere presence compromised the group too much. They have to be officially disavowed. They cannot in any way associate with the S.H.I.E.L.D. team anymore or they'll bring the entire team down. They basically have to be sacrificed in order for the team to continue to exist. And so the intention was that they were going to go off and be in their own show, Marvel's Most Wanted, which ABC declined to pick up ultimately. So that's Whoops. two female starring series that ABC either canceled or failed to move past pilot phase. But the premise is pretty solid, actually. They don't have the backing of S.H.I.E.L.D. anymore. They don't have the backing of the U.S. government. They have a lot of enemies completely on their own. They're isolated. Well, that's Black Widow's role, too. The governments are actively looking for her. She is one of superpowered beings. She's probably seen as a key to finding the Avengers, even though she doesn't know where the fucking Avengers are anymore. So everybody's going to be after Black Widow. And then, of course, all of her history is now public knowledge as well. All kinds of biases, all sorts of people that didn't... Like, there's Zemos. The world is full of Zemos looking for Black Widow. Never has there been a more perfect time. Never has Black Widow been more perfectly positioned to be in a movie than now. I want to see that movie now. Yeah. And she can't have fucking Falcon in her movie and she can't have Hawkeye in her movie because they're fucking off in Wakanda right That's now. Right. And she can't know about that. So she has to be on her own. They just made a big deal about how Margot Robbie has her production shingle. And she's obviously gotten a lot of heat since Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. She's getting a lot of heat as the central player of Suicide Squad to the point where people are starting to realize wait, this whole Joker thing hasn't really worked out and we've been trying to push Jared Leto as the thing that was going to sell this movie, but fucking Margot Robbie and her hot pants and her goofy accent are what's got most people excited that aren't Mr. Fix-It. Um, Very true. What, I don't know if you guys heard, have you heard about this? Am I, I'm not ringing any bells with you, am I? No. She and her production team go into Warner Brothers and they say, let's do this. Let's do a Harley Quinn solo movie, but instead of it being just a solo movie, she's also going to be meeting and teaming up with other heroines of the DC Universe. She has her own team of book now called Harley Quinn's Black Book where it's, it's just like Marvel Team Up or DC Comics Presents or Brave and the Bold, where it's her and some other character, usually a heroine, but sometimes not. And the, I guess to some degree, I mean, I don't want to make this comparison. Nobody wants to make this comparison. Wolverine Origins. Or Wolverine's just running around and meeting people, mm -hmm. but not horrible. And so that's like Forrest Gump. Yeah, kind of a little bit, but that's probably not the comparison anybody
anybody really wants to draw either. All right, sir. But the point is that's she's... the one I want to make, so that's what okay, we're making. Fine. So Harley's going to go off and meet other heroines, and they're talking about, well, that's a good way to get Black Canary or some of these other DC heroines that aren't as well known but could work at her level and get them introduced and, and start building their universe through Harley Quinn. And so they're going to make it. They've actually said, okay, this is a great idea. Sign some contracts. Let's get this shit made. As long as Suicide Squad doesn't tank and it's not going to, and we know this, as long as you don't alienate the audiences, we're just going to go ahead and make this movie and build up our universe. Well, Black Widow can do the same fucking thing. They don't even have to wait as long because Suicide Squad is out this year. They can be working on a Black Widow movie, well, fucking Ghost in the Shell, that's right. She's working on Ghost in the Shell, so I imagine they're going to wait and see if Ghost in the Shell goes over. But have Black Widow go out and start introducing all these people from the greater Marvel Universe. You know, Chloe Bennett from Marvel's Angels of the Shield was bitching recently about how the movies make no acknowledgement of any of the TV characters. Have her fucking, have Natasha and Jessica Jones run around for a little bit in a movie. She's trying to be on the down low. She's trying to get some information. She's to farm out some help. Or introduce brand new characters through the Black Widow movie and let her be the one who's generating the next franchise and she's the headliner who's getting this stuff done you don't have to put her out there completely on her own but there's such a wealth of stories to tell with that character now that i want to see that shit happen i'm excited about the prospect of a black widow movie it, again it's like this in these stupid amazing adventure stories this is a situation where i feel like even if ike perlmutter wasn't getting in the way of making a black widow movie i don't think that the world was really ready for her to have her own movies yet i don't think that they'd laid enough groundwork mm-hmm. within these movies that she is a guest star or co-star in for her to have her own movie and have that work but I think at this point they'd be fools not to make that movie I think that the character has proven herself the actress has proven herself there's so much material to mine that we've moved past the point of what would you do why we're making a Black Widow movie just to make a movie now that's a story that needs to be told that's a story that I think everybody would be excited to see I honestly I'd rather see a Black Widow movie than the Wonder Woman movie that's coming out next year I want Wonder Woman to be in a movie obviously I hope that movie's going to be fucking awesome but because it was made under the Zack Snyder mentality I'm afraid it's just going to be more of the same bullshit I'd be more excited to see right now at this moment a Black Widow movie than to see the Wonder Woman movie they've already made. Yeah, I'm not sure about the whole team up deal though. Well, I'm not saying that. Uh, what I'm saying is, I know. That, okay, I know you yeah. weren't saying. You were saying that's an option. I'm not saying make it a team up movie. What I'm saying is that when Black Widow's out there in a movie, and if you're afraid of Black Widow not being able to carry the movie on her own, don't go and grab the same guys and do the same shit they've already been doing. Let's see into look at more the uh, Marvel espionage community. In the most wanted series, they were going to hook up with Thing Rames, who was going to play Dominic Fortune, the mercenary character. No. Well, I'm not saying that you need to do that in the Black Widow movie, but you could go to those type of characters, hopefully a higher end ones, make, you know, have her on a Russian adventure. Fuck, you could have her dealing with Zemo since she didn't get the chance to do it in this movie, but let her explore the Marvel Universe and bring in some of these elements that work for her that wouldn't necessarily work in the other people's movies. And you can also build franchises out of Black Widow as well. It didn't have to be a team up movie like the Harley Quinn's going to be, but when you're doing a Marvel movie, you're going to have to have Marvel characters. Like you said, Maria Hill is- shows up, Nick Fury shows up. You still create a circle of people for her to work around and you can generate stories out of her there are a lot of marvel characters that need to be introduced and she they can be introduced in her movie the to- problem though is that i think you have to do some governmental shit with her and i think people are starting to kind of get over the governmental shit but, but you know she have more high- she's I a fucking like she's a renegade i just feel like you, that's what they would do you got to go back to the tap and she's got to be running from some government or she's got you know what i mean well she is running from they're all running from the government yeah, right I know, now i know but they, but they're all running from the government so you're just going to have another government you have, well, are you saying a versus movie. the superhero movies or just in general like Jason Bourne and fucking uh, uh, the, the well, fact that the Civil MIM War, team is always... Of ways, in a lot of ways, the Captain America side of Civil War was very much a Jason Bourne movie. Mm. And didn't even Winter Soldier play Jason Bourne in one of these other knockoff Bourne movies? Or was, am I thinking of Clint? No, you're thinking of Clint. He was in the Bourne Supremacy or some shit? Whatever that... Uh, okay. The Bourne Ultimatum? I don't know. Some bullshit Freaking like that. Bourne Infinity War? Bourne Infinity Crusade? So, I don't know. I just... I feel like, yeah, I think that she's got as much cachet right now to do a movie. I just don't know what the plot would be that would make sense for her I, that fucking, isn't kind of already sort of rehashing what we've already done in Captain America or some shit like that. She's on the run. She's got to do something, you know, MacGuffin. And she hangs out with fucking Luke Cage and Iron Fist and all these other fuckers. And it lets them actually get tapped in the movie. Do a Black Widow movie where she does hang out with the Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because it's much easier to get these TV actors to appear in a Marvel movie than to get the Marvel movie actors to appear in the TV show. Yeah, like you just said, nobody fucking watches that show. So why watch but, but popping up in a You movie? would get so excited for the connection, though, just to, even a cameo. You would get more excited because it would still make her feel part of, like a big part of the Marvel Universe because she's the world's ultimate spy. So she's not going to go off and fight some stupid ass Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. villain. She's going to go off and fight a big deal badass like fucking Scorpio or something. I mean, don't get me 
wrong, relatively speaking. You know, she could go off and fight the kind of guys that Nick Fury used to fight. Okay, okay. You know, do the super spy shit. Do the kind of shit that Nick Fury used to do, but now you've got a woman who's a ass kicker doing the kind of shit that he did. Have her go up against the fucking Zodiac. Yeah. Have her been in an interesting locale like in Asia or someplace where we haven't spent a lot of time and she's kind of standing out like a sore thumb, but she's got a mission that she's got to take care of with everybody's after her, but she's dealing with this right here. So you can have a fucking action sequence whenever the fuck you want to because everybody's after her. But you also have to have that superpower element. You have to make sure she's still part of the Marvel Universe because she's too big for just playing Jane spy adventures. She's got to be going after superpowered elements and be the underdog in those situations. And you see her, you know that she's a badass, but now she's a badass without a Hulk backing I, her up. I, I dig the Zodiac. Mm-hmm. I can see that. So let's do that movie. Or the Magia. When do you, you know, wanna... have, have her trying to seek asylum and she ends up running up against the Marvel incarnation of the mob and have her go up against somebody like Silvermane, the cyborg dude. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. When do you want to start drafting a copy of it? I'm just kidding. Like I said, I, I agree. I just think that that would be the trouble isn't, I don't think making the movie, the trouble is finding an appropriate script that's not rehashing government spy shit that's already been done. And it, again, not only in the Marvel universe or sort of just aping a Jason Bourne kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that's a key element. That's like, uh, that's one of the issues I was going to So have. if you can find an original spin with Ant Man, like, I don't know what the hell they're going to do with Ant Man. Well, Ant Man, that movie's totally different than the other movie that has come out recently. The whole caper style kind of stuff. Well, you know and, I mean? and that's totally another different. obvious connection there, too, is Scott Lang is hiding in Wakanda. Wasp and uh, uh, Hank Pym don't know it that. And so they could be seeking her out to find out information on her, or they could be needing her as an agent for some activity that they have that Ant Man is no longer available for. You know, there's, there's all kinds of ways of making this work. You use the universe to buoy this film. But what would be great about a Black Widow movie is is that you would have the Marvel Universe, but it wouldn't be as oppressive as some of the more recent movies have been. You could make uh, notations of, okay, this guy was doing this and this guy was doing that, but you don't have to draw in like 15 different characters and all their different histories and how it all interconnects. You just use it to give it flavor and to make it distinctly different from all the other spy movies that are out there. Yeah, but you are right, though, that now is the time because then you don't have the, why doesn't she just call Iron Man? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't she just call Captain America to come help? Now it's like she can't. Right. Because they're on the run and or hate her guts. Well, also, and the fact is, the Mission Impossible movies are still making a bunch of fucking money. The last Bourne movie didn't do that great, but the ones that Matt Damon were in or, did really well. if you really wanted to, you could even have her wrap up one of these last Infinity Stone stories. Possibly, yeah. I'm, you know I'm I mean? not we're, a huge fan of dealing with that. No, I know, and, but it would tie her more to the cosmic well, yeah, you could definitely, not, not that she'd be in space, yeah. but it's Hydra's got one. She's looking so. for a Fabergé egg like you had an octopus sure, and, it and it just happens to have a stone inside of it nobody knows about it weird shit's happening around it <laughs> I know it's a weird thing the orb from the adventures of Briscoe County Jr yeah. Yeah, where it's, it's, it's a orb. western stories it's wild wild west done all over again but you have this one metaphysical element that's making things all fucking weird and she has to deal with that weirdness yeah yeah, yeah. so it still ties itself into the Marvel Universe it's not Loki staff and they're going through space and doing all sorts of crazy shit it, you know what I mean anyway well no literally like the space stone it, it, yeah. if somebody has a device that allows them to teleport which would be hugely important to spies or hugely important to government so is her on her own as a normal flesh and blood yeah. human being have to, having to deal with that crazy shit? Trying to get this teleportation device that turns out to have a stone. Yeah. And it all ties together. We work this shit out. Well, there Cut you us go. a check. Cut us a check, please. Send that to Marvel Superheroes Podcast, P.O. Box 18527, Houston, Texas. I don't even know. That's, is that a real P.O. Box? No. We receive new Twitter follows from Basement Condition Podcast, Ben Bailey, Careless Deviation Podcast, Cutaways Podcast, David Taylor, Fitness Vegan, Ice in the Face Podcast, and Naomi Street Art. We got retweets from Bam Comics Podcast, Between the Pages, Comic Reflections, Dr. Ange, The Shazam Cast, Siskoid, and Talk Nerdy to Me Podcast. Twitter favorites from Brody's Kitchen, David Golding, Funny Comics, Justin this is First Dawn, Long Box Crusade, Podcast Radio, Pal Science, Ryan Daly, Say Hello to the Bad Guys Podcast, Sean Phillips, Steve Sellers, Wilson Fisk 187, and Wonder Woman Warrior for Peace Podcast. Now the Merry Marvel Marching Society, the 108 Sage, Ali Bats, a Beardo Talks Film Podcast, Bud's Beer and Brutality Podcast, Chris Sheehan, Columbus Comics Corner, Darren and Ruth Sutherland, Dude Imagine If Podcast, Fast Forward Rewind Podcast, Geek Yogurt Podcast, Good Times Great Movies Podcast, Joe Crawford, Just in Time Podcast, Keith G. Baker, Kevin Daji, King Size Comics Giant Size Fun Podcast, 
the League of Geeks, Namor Submariner podcast, OMAC debate, Out of the Fridge, Pietro Maximoff, Richard Field, Shampoo, the Silver and Gold podcast, and We're All Monsters. The Marvel Superheroes podcast is in no way affiliated with or endorsed by Marvel Entertainment. All characters mentioned and audio clips employed are believed covered under fair use, with no infringement intended against their copyright holders. The views expressed in this podcast are assumed legitimate, truthful, and solely possessed by the speaker. The beginning of this issue starts out with Tony Stark. He's working on this anti-gravity device. And this is where already this story went off the rails for me. He decides wait, wait, to wait, just... Wait, 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 This is... He won the, the anti-gravity device was in the, the solo the con- story, isn't it? the comic book. No, right, no. but... It, no, it's... Oh, it is in the comic yeah, book? Yeah, yeah. This is in... In the, in in the, the first, first part? This is in the first appearance oh. of Black Widow. Okay, my bad. So, he is trying to mess with this anti-gravity device, and then fine, he says something like... I can't get this thing to work, so I'm just going to arrange the wires a certain way. Hey, it's set up like this. Let me give it a shot. And lo and behold, this anti-gravity device works. And but he says that he didn't even – and he says it before he turns this shit on – that he didn't even try and remember or write down how he arranged it, right? So he fires this thing up. It works. And he's like, my god, it works. There's no way I can duplicate this. This is the only one I've made. I'm the brilliant Tony Stark, and I fucking happenstanced lucked into this shit. So he goes on and he tells the army, hey, I finally perfected this anti-gravity device, but I got to tell you, I'm this brilliant scientist. I don't know how I did it and I can't replicate it. He keeps saying it over and over again, making him look shittier and shittier. So as he's demonstrating it for the uh, army, there's some paparazzi guy who snaps some pictures of it. He runs off. The, the USSR catches wave of this. So they say, hey, you know what? We got to send motherfucking Boris and, Natasha. Boris and Natasha out there, Borak and Natasha to get this shit. So that's kind of where the story goes. They're going out. They're trying to get this anti-gravity device. Fuck, I think you're right. This is the second issue. <laughs> God damn it, man. I am off my fucking rails today. <laughs> nothing, not yeah, I got to follow along. This is the worst podcast ever. <laughs> no, dude, how the duck for the worst? You think it was the worst? I said it was the worst and you disagreed with me. No, obviously. Yeah. yeah, that's the actual worst. But in terms of editing, Power of the Duck is a fucking nightmare. Because you have to understand, we're discussing one part of the movie while another part of the movie is playing. This is going to be the worst one to edit ever. So the continuity is completely fucked up. I, I kept thinking, I should have been done with it like Wednesday or Thursday. And I'm still working on it on Saturday because I can't get the continuity straight between what we're talking about versus what's on the screen. I should have said the creative team was on this too. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay. So the story starts out. Fuck me. <laughs> the story starts out that, with that's that's would be kind of an interesting story to start out with. Uh, was that Black Widow? That or? would be way better than this actual issue. So did Ivan Vanko have a career in the comics or what? Okay, Anton Vanko is Mickey Rourke, Whiplash. No, he was Ivan. I think you're right. No. Any, did, is IMDb you're checking this one? For the purposes of our podcast, no. It's all coming back to me. (laughs) Edit all this out, you fucking asshole. You had to bring up goddamn Whiplash. Civil War. Anton Vanko's first appearance was Iron Man vs. Whiplash, 1 through 4, based on the character from Iron Man 2. Okay, so Iron Man vs. Whiplash was a cinematic universe comic book, not an actual Marvel comic. So Anton basically, was created for the basically. movie is what we're seeing? Yes. Okay. So and Anton is the father then? No, Anton is I don't know. Wait, what? Ivan Vanko is Whiplash in the movie, no, right? No, Anton Vanko is Whiplash in the movie. Ivan Vanko is Chris Look Dynamo. at Mickey Rourke's fucking IMDb page. I'm telling you, okay. he's Ivan Vanko and I, the father is Anton. Anton Rocky Horror? <laughs> <laughs> Did he rub black with his feet? Did he touch her feet in a familiar way. Look, man, touching a woman's f- feet and sticking your tongue in the holiest of holies ain't even the same goddamn thing. Ain't even the same. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> sticking your tongue in the holiest of holies. Don't tell me that doesn't look good. I'm, I do look. I am a huge fan. Is that white toast too? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So, you, so you did it fucking right. Some people are huge advocates of wheat toasted. 
I know. I know. You're going to eat a goddamn grilled cheese. I, I can't even say it without it, fucking. It's it, disgusting. Real, well, no, it's not just that, though. There's nothing remotely healthy about a grilled cheese sandwich. So don't try to pretend like you're doing something for yourself by making it wheat bread. It's fucking stupid. And it tastes all sour and weird. Fucking gross. I can see sourdough being good, though. Nope. White fucking toast. He plays Ivan Vanko. Fucking weird. Well, then why did Anton Vanko bring up Whiplash's Wikipedia page? Where Under what other context would Anton Vanko come up? I don't fucking know. Professor Anton Vanko, the first Crimson Dynamo. Now I'm all confused. Crimson Dynamo, Anton Vanko. Shit, we're going to have to re-record this whole fucking podcast. <laughs> You ever think I can charge my phone? Probably. I need the I need the micro USB, please, to power my cellular device. Thank you. <laughs> Finish your Sorry. cheese sandwich, you American <laughs> bastard. I'm gonna sneeze. It didn't happen. <laughs> Fuck you, edit that out. By the way, I can't tell you how many times... Do not 100% finish chewing that <laughs> fucking sandwich before you talk in a goddamn microphone. Have some respect. You're disrespecting me right now, you're disrespecting the listeners, and you're disrespecting that, that poor piece of foam covering that microphone that now has chunks of cheddar. Oh, God, that is <laughs> awful. That is terrible. I can't tell you how many times I had to edit out Mr. Fix-It snorting... During the movie recordings. I don't know what that's about. Over and over was again. Was he really doing that? He was doing that the whole time. He had a, he had a nose full of snot, and he just oh, kept he sucking did. it up on yeah, us. I yeah. yeah, he had a little uh, head cold thing. In this story, we've got Ivan Vanko, and he's sent by the Ruskies to... Nope, what? Anton Vanko. Anton Vanko's in the... No, I thought he was Ivan in the cartoon we just watched. I don't know what the fuck his name was in the cartoon. In the comic book, he's Anton Banco. Okay, you just read the comic, so I'm going to believe you. Where's your fucking iPad? <laughs> uh, it's charging downstairs, just like your phone's charging. Get the iPad. <laughs> You're going to edit all this shit out, dude. I'm not even fucking... This is just completely destroys our podcast. <laughs> hey, buy some Lysol at the store. We need to spray these mic condoms down. So that does make Oh, sense. does he have super strength? I didn't catch that part. Yeah, but when he first walks into the office, he's talking to main goon Russian boss. He was like, hey, come around my desk. And he's like, Boris does not come around desk. He lifts desk. And he like picks the desk up over his head. And everybody's like, damn, this dude's for real. I uh, only just this last week saw Rocky Four for the first time. So I guess he's just the, the way that guy was. off my – we need to do a Rocky Four podcast. No, we really don't. I th- Rocky One- Four is real. I'm telling you, dude. I get so fucking hyped when I watch Rocky Four. It's unavoidable. You cannot not get hyped up watching Rocky Four. I, I could dispute that because not only did I not get hyped, I could go the rest of my life without ever seeing that you trash are out again. Out of your mind! It's what are you horrible, about, dude. All the cheesy music, the montages. There's literally a song length montage of scenes from previous Rocky movies as he's driving around in his sports car oh, to this shitty Team America nope. World Police no, 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 music. No, nope, no, no. It's horrible. Great parts of Rocky Four. When Apollo Creed dies. It's that was an cool. exhibition. Who fucking saw that coming? Well, Nobody it, would have seen them killing Apollo Creed at the beginning of the fucking movie. No, I'll give you that. It's just that I, before I'd ever seen a Rocky movie, I already knew that happened because I think I read the Two. Mad Magazine. Two. It touches on steroid use because that's how they got Ivan Drago. That's how, or was it Anton Drago? Just kidding. <laughs> Uh, that's how he gets all fucking roided up and crazy, and he's going nuts and all. Right, they're doing the whole parallel thing where he's working in the lab with the scientists, where Rocky is out on a cliff doing it natural, dude. Even though we know, you know, Stallone was fucking juicing like a motherfucker. He was shredded in that movie. Three, he almost died in that movie. Stallone did. Yeah, because the fuck is the fucking actor that did uh, that was uh, Ivan Drago. Oh, you're talking about uh, Dolph Lundgren. Dolph Lundgren is a legit boxer, and so they were actually making contact in those fighting scenes, and he hit him so hard, he, like, ruptured his spleen, or he had some sort of internal bleeding. <laughs> God in heaven. I, dude, legit. He's been very complimentary of... I, I think they went through the cast and, like, talked about how any of those guys could actually fight, and he was like, Dolph Lundgren could have been a legit heavyweight boxer. Like, well, his reach has got to be fucking ridiculous. Dude, freaking... How dude. tall is that guy? I don't know. He's got a flat top. That... It, <laughs> 
<laughs> it skews things. And Stallone is really short. It's yeah. difficult. It's difficult. To tell. Like you would think like uh, Schwarzenegger's super, super tall. He's really not that tall. Oh, no. I didn't, oh, Schwarzenegger's not Schwarzenegger's that tall? Schwarzenegger's really not that tall. Uh, he's in the sixes. Oh, wiki, hit it up, buddy. Okay. Right. When you watch First, first I got to spell Schwarzenegger. No, just type Arnold and it's it does it. Six foot two. Six two. He's is, a lot smaller than you would think, though. Yeah. Not that not that six two is small, mine, but the much smaller. Yeah, let's see how tall Dolph Lundgren is. Six five. That's, oh yeah, that's that's, a, that's tall, significant. Dude. Yeah. So type Schwarzenegger again. Stallone's what five. Stallone is five ten. Not no, he's one hundred percent not five foot. No, he is. I guarantee he's not five ten either. That's reported. Okay. Right. So now type Schwarzenegger Chamberlain. Incredible picture that broke the internet when I first saw. <laughs> oh, I've seen this one. This is the best picture ever. Will Chamberlain is so fucking enormous. Well, so is Andre the Giant, mind. We've got to do a podcast on Andre the Giant. Can you see how big Andre's hands are? So we're going to go, we're going to go way off. There are pictures. So type Andre the Giant hand. You have to do it. They said that his hands were so big that you could pass a, an egg through one of his rings. Oh, shit. <laughs> It makes a grown man's hand look like a child's. That's, that's Muhammad Ali. Muhammad, <laughs> look at the expression of Muhammad Ali's face. Muhammad Ali had like an 84-inch reach. Muhammad mm. Ali is a large human being. Mm. Large human being. That is freakish, dude. That is freakish how big his hands were. I don't know how legit real that is, but that's awesome. So here are some stories of Andre the Giant that are fucking awesome. One, he got into an argument with somebody who rear-ended his car, so he got out and turned the guy's car over in the street. He picked it up and flipped it over the street. Two, you can pass an egg through one of his rings. Okay, those are my two Andre the Giant stories that I think are incredibly awesome. I love Andre. Andre the Giant fascinates me. They also said that he would drink like infinite because he could never get drunk. His body would process all the alcohol and he could he could never – he never would like feel the effects of alcohol. Then I think there are also some weird stories about him not being able to impregnate ladies because he was too giant. And then he finally was able to and it freaked him out or something. I don't know. None of that should be in the podcast. I'm not so sure. I think you're much more excited about Rocky IV and Andre the Giant than you were about the Black Widow. The montage of him working out in the barn is fucking awesome. I saw that. It's okay. With the beard? Fucking the, awesome. Stallone should rock the beard more often. He, Both him and Schwarzenegger are much better looking with the beards. Much cooler looking. Uh, you're taking this to an uncomfortable spot. No, I'm not talking about like attractiveness. I'm saying they just look cooler. They look like more like badasses. But when he when he takes off his robe for that final fight, Stallone is outrageously shredded in that final fight. Crazy shredded. Like I don't know how much that dude had to work to get that I don't know what he, that dude was putting in his body to look like that. He is insanely fucking ripped for that final fight. It's crazy. It was a great fight. And when they get to the whole fucking crowd, I actually didn't watch. I, I, didn't, I didn't actually watch oh, the, man, the fight. I think I glanced at it a few times. No, it wasn't really interesting. He, he turns the whole Russian crowd against the fucking. Russian. I heard the speech. Oh, so great. It's, really it's hard great. not to root for a guy who's like five foot six in reality. <laughs> five eight, maybe, maybe. It's a really good fight scene, but it's not as good as Ro- Rocky Three with Mr. T is the best one. I know this is you mean the fight. Is the best. Not the, no, the, the no, Rocky the, whole, the movie is the best movie. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the best movie. The one I can watch over and over and over again. I can watch Rocky 3 a million times over and over and over Yeah, because Rocky's depressing Followed as close. Yeah, he fucking loses. People forget Rocky loses in Rocky 1. People don't remember this shit because nobody actually watches these movies. Well, you all nowadays they watch, actually them a, watch Rocky they, 3. They watch them in a marathon, so they forget that where Rocky ends and Rocky 2 begins. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it blends. Rocky 3 and Rocky 4, I can watch infinite times. Those are two great movies. Those are some just awesome, fun movies to watch. I don't think I've ever seen Rocky 3. Oh, Rocky I know I've badass. seen Rocky. I mean, I own Rocky. I know I've seen Rocky 2. I remember T him winning the fight with Apollo. Ro- I think I only got to see like the first 15, 20 minutes of Rocky 3, and that's all I've ever seen. Clubber Lane, Mr. Mr. Right. Character. They made an action figure of Clubber Lane. Is, I remember that. He is – you hate that guy. He is so hateable in that movie. It's he's a bad motherfucker in that movie, and you are like, I fucking hate this guy. And he, and, but you also hate Rocky in the beginning too. So when he mops the floor with Rocky, you're like, oh shit, this guy's a fucking beast. He's basically Mike Tyson in that movie. It's awesome. Was Mike Tyson already active at that don't point? Don't know. I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, he had to be. That was the late eighties, wasn't it? When he got active, mid to late eighties. Hit it up. Now I have to. <laughs> we've gone down this wiki rabbit hole now. It says he's five ten. That's not true either. He's only five ten. It says five. No, he was. He's notoriously short. Mike Tyson. I didn't realize Mike yes. Tyson was oh, short. He's I didn't tiny know that. dude. Yeah, he's super small for a heavyweight fighter. But his arms were larger than like larger than large. Also a genetic freak, Mike Tyson. Well, you know, come to mention it, I, 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 he was in an episode of How I Met Your Mother where he and Kobe Smolders, I don't recall there being a real big difference in their heights. And Smolders is supposed to be pretty tall, isn't she? So 85, it 85, looks like. 85, 86, 87 is when he started going nuts. When okay. did Rocky Three come out? I feel so bad for you having to edit this. This is never going to make air. 82. 82. Oh, so shit. no, definitely not Tyson. Oh, okay, edit all that out. I was wrong. Well, I mean, Apollo, Creed, I say- Apollo Creed was very much Cassius Clay. 
Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder who... Was there like a beast like Tyson before Tyson? I wonder... Uh, oh, there had, yeah, there had to be. So who was Clubber? Because he didn't come up with any of these characters. He stole all of these characters. Let's get that straight. Sylvester Stallone ripped off all of these characters. There's not a... Well, they'll, they'll keep going down. There's usually that sort of stuff is in the production, usually. So, I mean, so George Foreman, that makes sense. Larry Holmes, the, the big bruisers. Liston Foreman and Larry Holmes, that makes sense. I like how they had to combine three different guys to get to, to Clubber Lang. Yeah. Have you ever watched that? I also like that the, the guy who answered that question has got an Archie Bunker icon. Yeah, that's awesome. Meathead. So have you, did you ever watch the movie The Real Rocky? No. You should watch The Real Rocky. It's the, are you sure that I should watch yes, the Rocky? Yes, you should watch the real Rocky. Okay, because I'm notoriously it's, averse to sports. It's oh, it's got so little to do with sports. Okay. It's, it, it's jaw dropping. The story of Chuck Webner is jaw dropping when you can when you compare it to uh, Rocky, and it goes into the lawsuit against Sylvester Stallone. It's good. Okay, I'll the real Rocky is really we'll good. We'll check that out. That's a thirty for thirty, but I don't think that one's available on Netflix. Motherfucker! I think you'll have to find that. It may be bootlegged on YouTube or something, but I, I suggest seeking it out and finding it. It's really good. Okay. You're like, wow, that is kind of like Rocky. And you're like, wow, wow. You're like, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> and you find out that he and Sylvester Stallone were buddies and everything. It's really it's really bizarre. Yeah. Or bizarre, you mean problematic, troubling, uh, ethically. Bizarre that it took so leverage. long to reach a conclusion. Okay. Oh, the court case? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm pretty sure Stallone could afford better lawyers. He should have bought better ones. Because <laughs> he got took. Okay. Yeah. You just spoiled it. Spoilers. I did not spoil it. Trust okay. Me. That's <laughs> so. That's hey, how about that Black Widow? So Black Widow, she was played by Flavor Flav's wife in Rocky IV. Just kidding. Well, it's what funny that name? you mentioned that, though, name? because Brigitte Nielsen is Bridget, who you're talking yeah, about. Bridget Nielsen. But you do have a bit of a connection there, too, because Brigitte Nielsen tried to play She-Hulk. There's a promotional image of her from the early 90s oh, shit. with her decked out I in green with, with like a silver outfit. And then Angela Bowie, wife of David, tried to get a Daredevil series off the ground where she cosplayed as Natasha from the 70s. And it didn't get picked up by anybody. All But there's promotional art out there that's pretty nifty. Well, at least she looks good. The guy who dresses as Daredevil is ridiculous. He looks like he made his shit out of kitchen utensils. But... <laughs> But she looks good because, again, it, she's just spandex. I want to see it then. Oh, we got to see it then. All right. So this was a pretty terrible origin. Uh, and then we actually read the issue after that, and it was just as bad. So here are some things that I want to talk about with Black Widow. Which, well, which is well, her best well, No, we have to. We have to. No, what we got it. We got to. We got to cover the story. What? What is the story? It's pretty basic. Is that Wonder Woman? Oh, shit. Oh, Yeah, she damn. did Wonder Woman, too. Oh, my God. That daredevil, that is. daredevil is ridiculous. Fucking what? Is, okay, look, I know I've insane. seen whatever that mask is made of somewhere. Where have I seen that? Is that just like stereotypical I, devil horns? I don't know. Who's that guy? The gay guy from the sixties that would be running around playing the devil. I he always know. spoke it like this. I don't know, but he wore devil horns like that. Rip torn? I don't know. Not yeah, ripped. see, it's face paint and. Dime store, de- it is. like magic store, devil horn. Does he still have his hair there too? Or is like no, he's got a, he's got a skull cap. He's got a skull cap on. And they wisely did it in black and white because I think the color would make that scene. In the seventies, that's weird. It was they were just big in the seventies. Oh well, heroin, heroin was, was pop- popular was, in the seventies. Uh, so anyhow, oh, <laughs> so far off course. Okay, so Ooh, Black Widow oh, actually had. Shit. What did you see in? Who was that? Nice work. Yeah, freckles. Okay. We're easily distracted. These terror these stories are really not. So very the second good at all. issue starts with Tony Stark. I guess we can't really cover Abattoir because I haven't read it recently. I'm okay. trying to think of Black Widow appearances that we've Yeah, are you good? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that was right. Because I see a woman I, in there. Yeah, you helped I, us to give us some fuel because we weren't doing very well yeah, on our own. Yeah, tell me what. I mean, I was like I've heard you rant about Black Widow enough times, I knew you had it in you. <sighs> Watching a documentary about a murderer <laughs> that happened in Memphis, and now you call me to this day, so I'm like, Ooh. grilled cheese sandwiches, rants against Black Widow. I know who I got to go to for these things. Black Widow's costumes are fucking awesome too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the great thing is when you've got a suit that's essentially black, 
or variations on dark shades. It's hard to screw that up. Yeah, but the gray one's awesome too, where she had the short hair with the little collar. Oh yeah, That's honestly, I, I kind of miss that. Uh, you, I, I was yeah, talking I'm about how it, I had this. Here's the two things: two women that I had issues with when I was younger is Black Widow and Storm. Because Storm with Mohawk when I was a kid freaked me out. I I, I couldn't deal with it. Yeah. And now it is like the hottest thing. She is so hot when she's got the Mohawk. I don't find her very interesting with full head of hair. It's just the Mohawk. I, there's something about it. I get I get this thing. I like women with shaved sides. Like let Natalie Dormer in in the new Hunger Games movie. Yeah. I really want to see that because she, nope, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for her. Dormer, or it doesn't work in general. Dormer's already she's got a sort of strange look. And I like that she she steers into it when she it tries to be too normal. To me, it doesn't work it doesn't, for me. To me, I understand what they're going for. Is there something that doesn't look right about it? Okay. Well, I've seen she did a, a, a magazine shoot while she still had the shaved head, this half shaved head. Ooh. It looks fake in the movie. Does it? it does, okay, it maybe looks, that's the issue. You, you gotta, did you see that? I think it was in Vanity Fair. Didn't see it, don't care. You gotta see it, it's good stuff. You like Natalie Dormer, though. I do. You saw that uh, short movie she did for the Michael Fassbender nope. movie, right? The Ridley Scott thing? No. You never saw that? No. Yeah, I showed that to you. It's really hot. Where we're, Michael Fassbender was shopping for lingerie. Uh, maybe I did. Yeah, that was really freaking hot. Anyhow, way oh, off yeah, topic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I saw that. You remember that one? That was her. Um, and then Black Widow, because her with long hair is... There's so many long-haired redheads. This she's going to be the second redhead we've covered in her own spotlight podcast, and we're not even you know 25 episodes in. But a short, intense-looking redhead, not not as much. Where, where she's got the severe crop. Yeah. So it makes her look much more distinctive uh, than all the other. Because I mean, honestly, how would you tell if Mary Jane Watson were to cosplay as Black Widow? It's true. And then so there's a great scene in a uh, this was a Kaminsky Morgan issue of Iron Man. Uh, when was this three in the th- early 300s maybe black widow this is another russian revisit we've got a, a new crimson another crimson dynamo titanium man comes back and black widow's in it a story i would have much rather read than this one but there's a great scene where tony and natasha are sort of getting reacquainted on one of his private jets and he drops a thing about you know i kind of miss the old costume and she's like the one with the fishnets and they both have this hilarious laugh together because you know they're old it's an old flame, so it was cool that he kind of harkened back to, I kind of like the one with the fishnets. You know what I mean? Like it was, <laughs> so it's nice that t- even Tony has his favorite of her costumes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I was expecting. Unfortunately, in, in these two issues, she wasn't in any really costume. But No, I mean, again, she's just, just a dress. Uh, she's just a dame. Yeah, which least. again adds to how... What a let down these issues. Well, it's a disappointment because it's just like if – what if we'd spend a few issues with Tony just running around in the suit? I mean Tony's cool and all, but if he's just millionaire playboy, he doesn't do anything. He's not physical. He's not fighting anybody. He's not inventing anything. He's just sort of like, I don't know, playing a detective. It's not even really Iron Man anymore at that point, is it? No. I mean and not just Iron Man. It's not even really Tony Stark by that point. If you have if you have him in like a, a, a locked door parlor mystery, it's – you're you're not looking for that. That's a Batman story. That's not a Tony Stark story. Okay, so we should say to everybody, this is not a good introduction to Black Widow, but you like Black Widow, and I like Black Widow. So we just felt that before we could really delve into other Black Widow comics, we should at least recap the origin. How many people have read Tales of Suspense 52 and 53? Uh, probably more than ever should have. I think that that is completely accurate. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm guessing that... Probably nobody that's listened to this, even people who really like Black Widow, have probably never really read those two issues. And, and they you, shouldn't, and, and we now. just saved you the trouble. Don't do that. Don't read the issues. Just they, leave it alone. They don't go into her past. Right? What, what kind of terrible origin is this? They don't go into her past. They don't really establish any sort of powers. They don't They do not do any of that. Well, I think the worst crime, especially in the first appearance, is she's not even a particularly compelling villain. She right. doesn't do anything. Boris is doing all the heavy lifting. So, I mean, when she's introduced, it's the Black Widow and her henchman. And the henchman does all the freaking work, and she doesn't do anything besides feign injury. It's... Yeah. That's not Natasha Romanoff. That's not the character that we know and, and want to see more of. This issue spits in the face of hashtag Frank's agenda. It does indeed. And I didn't care for it. But I'm glad we got it out of the way so we can move on to better things. Right. From this point on, we will cover much better Black Widow stuff. We promise. Except that we now have to calorie the Hawkeye early appearances, which appear feature the terrible Black Widow that we just covered. So we're still stuck with this chick. Is there for a, a chance it could be better? There's a chance. 